although you people will casually use the term my my use is grandfathered we try to help educate with, with terminology because it's not quote unquote grandfathered it is just non-conforming and they may maintain that use in perpetuity so long as they do not discontinue that use for 24 months or two or two years and then C, that the buildings or structures are maintained in their then structural condition, uh, association there with the nonconforming structure. We took the opportunity to clarify that the burden of proof is on the property owner, not on the city. That comes out of a case um, from 19, let me see if I get my cases correct here, 1979 in Knowlton v. Browning Ferris Industries of Virginia, noting that the Supreme Court of Virginia had explained that the rationale for placing the burden of proof on the property owner rather than the zoning administrator is because ordinarily the land user knows more than the zoning authority about the nature and extent of the use of the land since imposition of a zoning restriction and thus has a better access to evidence of whether the current use is a lawful non-conforming use. So that clearly demonstrates that the burden of proof is on the property owner, and we have taken this opportunity to make sure that that was clear in our code. That the use is reserved, um, that used, we used the opportunity to, for in Section 10.321 to organize and explain the differences between the nonconforming structures and nonconforming uses. Incidentally, in our current code, there is some ambiguity about what our interpretation uh, has been compared to what our what our existing text has been. So this is this is a, a big one for staff to be able to interpret it correctly. The fifth change here is explaining that enlarge or extended is referencing the size, character, or intensity of a use. What we're talking about here, um, oftentimes we get into uh, concerns that are brought to our attention about Oftentimes it's occupancy in residential units where there are more occupants in a building or in a residential unit than it should be. Um, and there's been some confusion on property owners' behalf where they're thinking, okay, if I, if I was, if I had five unrelated individuals in a particular unit, but they really only should have had four, there were arguments being put forth that they didn't discontinue the use because they did have four um, and the question of whether or not it was enlarged or extended beyond the character. And we've always interpreted that, yes, you have enlarged it, the character has been changed because you were gone beyond what the nonconformity was. And we're taking this opportunity to clarify that. So adding language to clarify that increasing occupancy or dwelling units does constitute an enlargement. And I did, I, I meant to read this earlier uh, in the presentation, um, but in a 1970, excuse me, 1997 case at the uh, Virginia Supreme Court in the city of Chesapeake v. Gardner Enterprises, the Supreme Court explained that the purpose of nonconforming use laws is to preserve rights in existing lawful buildings and uses of land subject to the rule that public policy opposes the extension and favors the elimination of nonconforming uses, and further that nonconforming uses are not favored in the law because they detract from the effectiveness of the comprehensive zoning plan. And that really helps us summarize and really capture, I think, uh, the whole purpose of why we have these regulations and why we have to have these strict stances and interpretations. We'll open this item up for a public hearing. Anyone who wishes to speak, please state your name and address. Uh, I would testify quite simply that you should table this recommendation and leave the decision for a future council. This is a very sensitive part of our zoning ordinance. Uh, and quite honestly, I don't trust the input of the city attorney's office in the direction that it's taking it. Um, it affects our zoning ordinance, which is not well understood at the moment. The city of Charlottesville is doing very intensive research on the history of zoning in their city so that they can get their housing issues right. Uh, when I've tried to present similar, his similar history before planning commission, it's not been well received. The chair interrupted me twice when I tried to talk about what the origins of our zoning ordinance are. Um, as far as I can tell, preliminarily so far, we put zoning into place uh, in order to facilitate segregation. 
in the 20s and 30s. It was a series of Supreme Court decisions at the time. The properties about which you just rezoned, being zoned industrial, was a very common practice right at that time. A lot of those nonconforming uses were in places where African Americans had historically owned property. Uh, without fully understanding how our city was laid out and why, and without having a clear direction on where we want to go, I think it's premature to jump to this enforcement uh, piece, which, as I read it, is, uh, is, a, is a tighter, harsher, less permissive uh, form than what we have currently. I think it's premature to do that, and I hope that you will vote to not accept this. Our city is changing very rapidly right now. Please give us uh, time to better understand where we're going before you add more enforcement powers and give more leeway to staff. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? See, and then I'll close the public hearing. Madam Mayor, it comes from Planning Commission with a six to one recommendation, and so I'm going to move that we approve the zoning ordinance amendments as presented. I will second that. Any discussion? Yeah, Pody, I was with you until they got to the end. Um, you lost me at the end, so I'd like to talk to you more because you're, you're right about the history piece and where you were going um, and everything you said was accurate and not just Virginia, but especially Florida and uh, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia is probably the biggest culprit of them all. But, um, but I don't think that the clarity... I think that this is trying to bring forth more clarity and not so much breaking that pattern that was, was happening in the you know the twenties through honestly in some places to now, right? Um, because ultimately a lot of it is gonna have to take what Mr. Saylor is doing. That's his last name, right? Saylor. Is uh um, yeah. Is that some of it's going to have to come from private enterprise to come back in and, and and modify some of those things because some of the layouts of cities were not just not only was it laid out it may have been laid out and due to segregation but it was already done that way because of a lack of integration right if that makes sense and that um before there was even talk of integration, right? There was already this divide. Harrisonburg didn't have the the agricultural history to even have that large of a divide. So some of the plots that were there just naturally created a space where some African Americans were and then where some weren't. And like we've discovered, or not not we, but JMU's discovered that there were literally African Americans in the Thomas Harrison House, um, that not the Thomas Harrison House, right? Um, so it just goes to show that um, looking at even looking at the history of Harrisonburg, people weren't where you thought that they were, and vice versa. Right. You know what I mean? So, um, but I think you have a I think you have a very valid point. I just um, I think that. I think that this brings clarity to an, a separate issue, not that your issue doesn't need to be brought up. And I think that, just like anything, um, in 45 days or or less or six weeks, you know, we can we can look at it again and, and bring and bring it back up again. So I don't want you. I, I, your your point did not fall on deaf ears. I mean, I heard you very clearly. It's just that I think that I think you're applying it. I think you're applying it properly, just not, not for this specific ordinance, though, if that makes sense. So, because I think that, um, yeah, because I, I can understand how this could lead to people like exasperating blight and things of that nature, right? And, you know, we've talked about that, and so I could see where this could go, but I don't think that's the spirit behind where this is intended to be. But I mean. Instead of tabling it, I think you can we can put it into play and look at it again in, in, in a couple of weeks. 
and if it, and if and if more comes up in the next two weeks, I think we can, um, you know, you can pull it off the consent agenda. You know, right? So but it's not in stone until two weeks from now. Anyway. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, I mean, I, I I hope everybody's clear about this. I know I'm something of the nerd in the group on on these issues, but yeah, I mean, the tip again, the, the context of these is we make. We make zoning changes from time to time, which are all part of a, a public process in and of themselves, usually a fairly elaborate one. And at times we decide that we want to change the zoning in an area. And there's a state law that says that there are these specific grandfathered rights that even though we have said we want a particular t part of the town to have certain characteristics, some of the existing uses get to stay. Uh, I want to strongly echo what I heard from Mr. Leibowitz, and I would add, continue where he left off, the plan also does not include anything about a federal job guarantee. Uh, if you think that's far off, the offices of Nancy Pelosi were occupied just in the last few days by one of our new Congress people demanding a Green New Deal, and she's only one in Congress. Closer to home, our Attorney General just announced a multi-million dollar initiative in a Richmond neighborhood, including related, um, re related elements. Ms. Dang did have more time, and that points up the heart of my comments. This plan doesn't represent a collective community vision. Don't call it that. Use the statutory minimum that some of you advocated at the start of this process and leave this document on the side as a reference. All that work isn't going to disappear. It'll be there. It'll just be properly understood as what it actually is. Uh, there is a strong mandate in this direction. Ms. Dang was right. There was a lot of uh, concern about public input. That's because this process didn't have those features. That's why it was such a uh, something that came up so often in these processes. The truth was stated properly by Chairman Way, guided by the commission, delivered by staff. That's what it was. A true dialogue, not preordained to the community. Uh, that wasn't the sentiment that I saw participating in this process. I'll give you two examples before some evidence and substantive, substantive difference that they make. It was true that the process was very well advertised. I was a part of multiple groups that anticipated mobilizing around rewriting the comprehensive plan. I was at this 85 person meeting and I saw a friend there who had been displaced during our four redevelopment and I caught her just before she left and asked her why she was leaving and she said oh, she thought that this was going to be uh, something about her neighborhood and she didn't feel like she belonged there that she had made a mistake in coming and before leaving she rattled off a lengthy list of things that were needed in this comprehensive plan and I hoped to have been able to on her behalf insert them but uh, as you may as you may know I was not one of the chosen few um, the process of choosing the committees could potentially have been representative if organizations and groups in the community sent forward representatives, but that's not how it was done. Planning Commission picked who they thought was representative, which was very disruptive to solidarity within pre-existing groups and formed di divisions and ended up not being properly representative. Uh, maybe we were successful in including all opinions. Well. I don't think so. I have evidence that we weren't. At one of the public meetings, I heard some folks, a, a couple older than me, walking out and stating this was predetermined. Our input made no difference. In the various working groups, we did not have scope to discuss the goals, objectives, and strategies. We, ba we barely were able to move the strategies, in fact. Uh, as for outcomes, I watched in some of the subsequent hearings, people come forward, one property owner in particular, who was chastised from the dais and asked 
why didn't you bring this up in the comp plan meetings? And he very humbly, very meekly said, well, I tried. And he gave several examples of how he tried, not being confrontational like me. Uh, and then he walked out and I caught him outside the room. And he too had a laundry list of brilliant ideas. He, for example, gave me insight into over-occupancy, something that we just discussed. Uh, in his experiences helping people in the immigrant community enter into an advance in our city. He gave, a, an, he gave me an example of people going through a period of over-occupancy, over, over for example, highlighting how important, Mr. Jones, it is to understand the dynamics here. Because if I was, for example, a member of city staff who ideologically had anti-immigrant feelings, a way that I might attack that, that issue might be to go after over-occupancy. That, that leaves me very suspicious of these processes. Now, if I could trust that everything was perfect and staff were completely up to date, I might feel more secure. But the greatest guarantee is to have this public accountability. So again, I would, uh, I would urge you to, uh, you know, for example, uh, things that don't exist. We have an EPSAC committee that's putting forward a, a, an, an environmental sustainability plan. That's evidence on its face that things are crucial things are fail to be included in this comp plan. We have another group coming forward with demands for criminal justice reform. Uh, again, prima facie evidence that there are crucial things not captured by having chosen to take the lens of physical land use that was chosen. These things should have been discussed. So in closing, I would ask you, please vote this down. Do not accept it. Instead, adopt a statutory minimum and leave this aside for reference. Thank you. Hmm. Anyone else? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Thank you. We, we can stop longer one way or the other. Thank you. So uh, I have three items to report on here this evening that are not on the regular agenda. I think I'm early. Am I? Was it somebody else? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Hold on one second. Hmm. Good practice. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> it's over. I don't know. Does anybody else want to talk? Are we sure? For, for well, we're in public comment. Public. Else. That's yeah. okay. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> anybody else like to come up with Stare. public comment? They can have the limited time that we have if they like. Uh, responding directly to Mr. Baugh's invitation, I'll open with some things that we can do to help people be better included in our processes. Uh, Mr. Jones, uh, the, inter the interactions that you folks had with EPSAC were exemplary of where our city is going and what we need. Um, however, they have a meeting coming up soon and I've not been aware of any processes where, where that outreach had happened or could happen that we wanted. It's been two weeks, man. Give so, a it's only been a couple of weeks. So <laughs> I'll suggest a, a, concrete, a, a concrete proposal, something that can be done before their next meeting. Disband the EPSAC committee. Disband the EPSAC committee and reconstitute it as an open meeting scheduled at the same time. Now staff is thinking, oh, we're going to get 12 people and it's going to be chaos to facilitate it. Well, have a, uh, pro a, a provisional chair, uh, have a vote to appoint a chair for the meeting and facilitate the meeting. Open that as a public meeting the way we did in the early stages of the Stop Punishing Our Nephews movement where we had multiple open meetings that were very productive, very engaging on how to deal with the jail issue that had come up. So a, a suggestion if we're, if, we're, if we're thinking about doing that. Um, <coughs> other suggestions, I would say uh, don't hire a justice coordinator. I've been saying that for some time. But now I have a little backing in a recent high profile opinion piece in the New York Times by Michelle Alexander who says uh, 
If our goal is not a better system of mass criminalization, but instead to create a safe, caring, thriving communities, then we ought to be heavily investing in quality schools, and I'll insert here for her, locally administering a federally funded job guarantee, and other such uh, programs in the least advantaged communities, rather than pouring billions into their high-tech management and control. I think that we're envisioning the justice coordinator not in this way, and Mr. Leibovitz gave us some examples of how uh, such a job description might be changed and moved to a different place in the city hierarchy. I would suggest that we let go of this idea of the justice coordinator, and we, we often talk about we don't have data. I keep giving you the data. We have the data. Please don't say we don't have the data. Uh, so that's a second suggestion. And finally, I will uh, close with an invitation. I'll change tone. Uh, now I'll speak as the secretary of the Martin Luther King Jr. Way Coalition. And I'll read to you a vision statement that was written by committee long, long ago, long before any of this. It says the Martin Luther King Jr. Way Coalition believes in inclusive community in which every person is loved and valued regardless of any differences and is empowered to participate, have a voice, and effect positive change in his or her community. Uh, toward the end of, of commemorating just how much progress we have made on that front to acknowledge the positive, I would invite you all to come to our annual commemoration in the middle of Martin Luther King holiday. Uh, on that Monday at 2 o'clock, we will meet on the corner of Mason and Martin Luther King Jr. Way and just go around the block. No need for police support, no possibility of excluding anybody. Just come and walk with us in the cold at 2 o'clock on Martin Luther King holiday to note just how much our community has achieved. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Closing public comment. And one last matter. <laughs> is uh, the tall grass and weeds data. Um, I do not have any slides for this, uh, but if you all want me to present this in another fashion, I'd be happy to do so. Before you, I gave you the data that from 2013 to, 25, or 2013 to 2018. Just pulled out some information to show it graphically in a different way. You can see the complaints received and proactively enforced properties across 2013 to 2018. The biggest difference here is that in 2014 we received a, or we took in a considerable amount of proactive uh, enforcement complaints, proactive enforcement there, and then it's you know one, four, two, and 15, 16, and 17. Um, at the bottom of the page on the first sheet, you're looking at the percent of complaints that were not a violation upon inspection. It ranges from 13% up to 30%, excuse me, from 5% up to 30%. In 2013, 13% of those that we went out to see uh, were not a violation. Over this last year of in 2018, 10% of those that we received complaints upon were not a violation once we got out on site. We also mapped them for your um, interpretation. You can see 2016, 2017, and 2018 alone. You can also see 2018, or all three years, and again, we just pulled out the last three years and what that looks like, um, just kind of scattered throughout the city. And these include complaints received and proactive enforcement. I will try to answer any questions you might have, but the data is in front of you. If you want to think about it for a while and ask me questions, call me up, email me, set up a meeting, I'd be happy to do any of that. I think this is great. Thank you. This is what I was looking for. Okay. Thank you, Adam.